The injury apocalypse is upon us, but don't panic. We're here to help. We've got your waiver wire rankings to help fill those holes in your lineup. We'll answer your questions, and we've got our buy low and sell high candidates here on today's episode of the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. My name is Nick, also known as Clickwood, and I am joined, as always, by my partner in crime, Dustin, also known as Project KSL. And guys, I talked about it in the intro. The injury apocalypse has happened here in week five. Seems like it happens every year, and I was just kind of like almost waiting for it this year. It, yeah. All these guys had avoided injury. We had, what, Jamal Charles had a little injury here. Uh, Adrian Peterson got the suspension. But like a lot of the top guys had been pretty darn healthy, unlike most years. But man, this week, a ton of guys went down, ones. man. Yeah. <laughs> Craziness. I mean, we got like Calvin Johnson, Jimmy Graham. Monty Ball, Reggie Bush, Rashad Jennings, Zach Stacy, uh, even guys like Drew Stanton for your two quarterback leagues. All these guys went down this week. Major injuries in some of the cases. You know, nothing career yeah. ending, nothing season ending, thankfully, it doesn't sound like. But man, this is the type of situation that we just like, we always worry about for fantasy football. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, like you said, it, it seems like there's always, you know, big injuries that happens like early on fantasy seasons. I mean, last year was Julio and a few others. And this year, like you said, it's been mostly, you know, injury free other than a few little ones here or there. But yeah, I mean, tons of big names all went down this week. Really and you know bad what's, week. You know what's craziest, craziest about it at all, all of it? Guys like DeMarco Murray and Rob Gronkowski, healthy. Yeah, they're still healthy. Yeah, they're injury prone <laughs> what? guys are still out there grinding. I have no idea what's going on. This is just a crazy, crazy situation. But uh, it's good to see Reggie Bush back on that injury report. I mean, he had he had been off it for a little while, and um, it, I mean, it's it, it's it's Boy something that he back just strong now too. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of Reggie Bush, obviously, but you know, you see him on the injury report multiple times every single year, and it's yeah, just it's no surprise. surprise. Yeah. So. Um, but you know what, man? I mean, this type of situation just really goes to prove how important depth is in fantasy football. And, I mean, it's it really goes to prove the difference between the people that know what they're doing and the people that just draft off of a big board. Yeah. Because if you if you really know what you're doing and you go in there and you get the guys and you're, you're paying attention to the waiver wire and you're picking up guys that, you know, are potential starters and guys who start to succeed and show that they've got something to give to their team – you can set yourself up to be in okay, you know, at least okay of a situation yeah. when injuries like this happen. One thing that I always that I always say when people do auction drafts and it's always you know stars and scrubs and it's just like I I it's so rarely it's so rare that you see that strategy work mm -hmm. because it's always I mean it's like oh man this guy's day one lineup is you know he has Jamal Charles and Lashawn McCoy and. Uh, Drew Brees and Rob Gronkowski, but then, you know, LeSean McCoy is not doing very good and Gronk gets hurt, you know? Right, right. And it's just like, well, your whole team's ass because you have $1 players on your bench, you know? And it seems like that's so prevalent that that strategy always happens. The bench matters more in fantasy football than, anyone, than most people ever admit. Like, if you yep. can stash guys and have them there consistently, even if they're dropping, you know, having good weeks on your bench every now and then, when you have a big injury, you'll be prepared to just fill them in and you won't miss a beat. Right, exactly. And uh, and to your point, the $1 players a lot of times are these type of guys who are really just flyers, you know, guys who we don't yeah, expect anything out of. But, you know, maybe, you know, it's kind of like a, a maybe could end up being OK kind of a thing. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people just they they throw those players away. You know, I've seen guys draft just stupid players that uh, are clearly not going to play football even anymore. I've seen people draft Tim Tebow like, ha ha ha, you get that cheap laugh. But then it's like, at a certain point in your season, you need that roster spot for an actual player. Yeah. And when these guys, the smart people in your league, see that in week one this guy breaks out or yeah, play the waivers. Um, yeah, you, you know they're out there picking up the right guys, and you're just sitting there going, "Well, I don't need them because you know Matt Forte and Jamal Charles are doing pretty well for me." Well, then you know once one of those guys gets hurt, you're in a tough situation. Yeah. So. 
I mean, something I've always prided myself on is, the, is that I play the waivers every single week. I'm always right. Whether I'm even if you're five and zero, oh. yeah, exactly. I'm always looking to add a hot guy to my bench and just seeing what happens right. there. I'm right. waiting to see if he has another week. Maybe I can move him and, and gain value in another position that I'm already strong at. You know, you always got to be looking at the waivers every single week. You have to see who's out there and what's happening in the NFL that week. Absolutely, and, and another thing too that I I know you're big on is handcuffing your studs. Yeah, and you can't really do it obviously with wide receiver. You can't really do it with tight end to, no, to really for the most part. Backs. You're right, but but your running backs, man, you need to be out there handcuffing some of these guys. Uh, even your guys like Rashad Jennings, your guys who are what I would consider to be your second, your third tier running backs. I think that there is definitely value in handcuffing them, especially in your deeper leagues, rather than rostering a guy who you're never going to play. I've seen people have guys like, you know, Stevie Johnson. Like, I know Stevie Johnson's a solid player, and, you know, from a week to week, you know, you never really know what you're going to get from him. He might drop a four on you. He might get a 13 the next week, but you're yeah, never I mean, confident with him in your lineup. It's a super inconsistent situation he's in, yeah. Right, and the big thing is though is that you never are, you never go into a week and you're like, okay, I got Stevie Johnson on my you know in my lineup this week. So I'm feeling pretty it. good. Like it yeah. doesn't matter what the matchup is for him. He he's not a guy who you're going to be excited about to have in your lineup. So rather than having him rostered, go out there and get a guy like a um, you know like a backup for uh, uh, one of your studs or a backup for a guy who's like I said a second or a third tier running back. Andre Williams being a big prime example yeah, because this guy was only owned in like 30% of leagues coming into this week. And I mean, prior to week four, when he scored a touchdown, he was owned in even less. So in most leagues, you could go out there and get a guy who is now going to be the starting running back for that team, at least for the next few weeks. Sure. And and, and also like, yeah, I mean, you can always just see that like, oh man, Andrew Williams got dropped. And even if you don't necessarily own Rashad Jennings, he's still a valuable handcuff. Any of those kind of guys, Correct. Miles Davis, him. You don't have to, you don't necessarily have to handcuff your own player. Yeah, you can That's handcuff good other point. people. You can troll people and do that too. Yeah. Yep. I, I mean, that, that's if he's, if you know that he's going to walk into a situation where you have a strong indication that it's not going to be a running back by committee, then yeah, get the handcuff. There's a lot yep. of situations where it just doesn't matter. I mean, if, you know, uh, I'm trying to think, like, I, I think if, um, um, who's a good example of this? Like, if a guy like MJD went down, it's just a shit show. You know, oh, it's yeah. really not a point in handcuffing disaster. a guy like Maurice Jones. Drew. Yeah, it doesn't It's matter. already a disaster. Yeah, even with MJD <laughs> bad. Or, or a guy yeah. like, um, another example of this would be, um, uh, uh, Andre Ellington. If Andre Ellington goes down, it's, it's a shit yeah. show. I mean, it's, yeah. it doesn't matter. So, it, but if you have a guy Very like you know, Jamal Charles, uh, an Adrian Peterson, you know, his handcuff is Asiata, a, uh, uh, Rashad Jennings, like you said, any of those type of guys. If Giovanni, Giovanni Bernard goes down, Jeremy Hill is a super, oh, super yeah. good handcuff. Yep, absolutely. I mean, there's there's a lot of guys that you just hold on to because injuries happen. that are super prevalent with running backs, and if they go down and you have that handcuff, you're walking you're you're walking into a very very good player for basically nothing. Right, and there and the the biggest example of that was earlier in the year when we saw Niall Davis become a, a top ten running back when Jamal Charles was out. I mean, this guy basically came in out of nowhere. No one really knew much about him. You knew quite a bit about him because you you follow that type of situation a lot more than other people do. Yeah. But your average football fan had never heard of this guy, and it's all about the situation. You know, you step in and you're a starting running back on an NFL team, and you're getting all the touches. It doesn't even really matter how bad you are. Like, I mean, even if you get three yards per carry, if you touch the ball 20 times and you get into the end zone, that's 60 yards and a touchdown. I mean, that's a solid game. And especially if you're in a PPR league and you can catch a few passes out of the backfield, you know, these guys are valuable. You have to be able to be smart enough to roster some of these guys. And even when a guy like Jamal Charles does come back and you see Niall Davis get only three carries in a game, you still keep these guys rostered if you can. If I mean, there's obviously going to be situations where, you know, you go out there and you're going to be able to pick up your guys who are more likely to get carries over the next couple of weeks. And, you know, if you need them to be in your lineup in that time frame, then you probably need them over a Nile Davis. But for most leagues, these guys are, they're very, very valuable to have on your team. Having those handcuffs is a huge priority. And, you know, now it's really going to become a, a big thing now with all these injuries to the running backs. I want to run through these again real quickly because we see, what is it, five of our main star starting running backs right now injured. Monty Ball, Reggie Bush, Rashad Jennings, Zach Stacy, uh, and then, you know, obviously we've got off and on injuries with a couple other people, but 
I, I mean, those are really, I guess, the main four, I should say. But um, which one of these situations do you think is the most concerning if you're an owner of one of those players? See, I, I don't really know if there is one I'm particularly overly concerned about, to be honest with you. I think that Rashad Jennings is going to be back soon enough. I think he's going to step right back and have his role. Mm -hmm. Zach Stacy doesn't appears to be pretty minor. I don't think any of them are overly concerning. It's just good opportunity for the short term. But I'm not going out and selling the farm for Andrew Williams if I had Rashad Jennings this week or anything like that. Sure, I think, sure. I think you could ride it out with an injury like that. So I mean, I'm not super concerned with any of them. You know, I you you mentioned the the uh, Rashad Jennings one, and I, to me, that's the most concerning. If I'm a Rashad Jennings owner, and the reason for it is because I think that Andre Williams is the most talented of the group of players that's going to be replacing these guys in the time for the time being. So, like you know, Andre Williams, let's say he steps in and gets a hundred yards this week and a touchdown. You know, what does that mean for Rashad Jennings going forward? Now, obviously, you know, you've got guys like Jamal Charles, who we saw, you know, Niall Davis had the big games when he was out. But as soon as he came back, he was getting 100 percent of the carries. Well, not necessarily 100, but, you know, 90 percent of the carries immediately. I don't see that necessarily being the case with Rashad Jennings. And I know you're higher on him than I am, but I came into the season with the assumption that I believe Andre Williams is the more talented of these two running backs. So uh, when he gets the opportunity, I think there's a real possibility that he gets, you know, 30 to 40% of the carries going forward, even when Rashad Jennings comes back. So that one's a little bit more concerning to me, I think, than it is to you. Yeah, I, I see. I still, I, I understand people like Andre Williams, but I don't think Tom, Co I don't trust Tom Coughlin to really write it out with a rookie. They paid Rashad Jennings a decent amount of money to come in and be a running back. And he's looked really, really good. He so has. unless he just comes mm -hmm. off and it's just like, man, you know, he, he really cannot move at all right now because the MCL is still hurting him. I really don't think he's going to lose many carries. I think it'll go. I think it'll be right back to what we saw in Kansas City, where even though Niall Davis lit it up, they knew what they had in Jamal Charles, and Jamal Charles is their guy. Right, right. Well, a couple other situations that I wanted to touch on real quickly. Calvin Johnson with the ankle injury. You know, we talked about this this past week on the show. We kind of agreed that going into this game, we would have both sat Calvin Johnson if we were the Lions. And the reason for it is not because that we don't think Calvin Johnson can be productive, but more so because you have to have this guy healthy for the remainder of the year, especially when you're in a competitive division like the NFC North. None of these teams is blowing them away the competition. None of them is going to run away with the division, at, at least at this point in the season. So why have your star player be unhealthy for a big stretch of the season. We need to have this guy healthy. I mean, and I think that we saw that when he got injured. He made one catch, got injured on that play. How yeah. concerned are you that Calvin Johnson is going to miss significant time at this point the, with this type of an ankle injury? Well, the thing that's so stupid is he should have already missed the time. He clearly right. hasn't been right for two weeks, and they're still trotting him out there. And they need, I mean, if there ever was He's a, a good guy, distraction. You need, just, you need to just sit down and shut him down for a few weeks and get him right so he's good for the next however many games, 12 games, whatever that would be. This right. would, it's the time. And instead, they're just like, no, I'll go out there, run around, keep fucking with your ankle, you know, hurting it, risk re it. And then he did. Of course he did, you know. Caught one yeah, ball, right. re-aggravated it, and there he is again. Now he's questionable again. So, I don't know. Anytime, apparently, they just, they just don't give a shit about getting him right, which I, I cannot understand for the life of me why they will not just rest him and get his ankle right for the rest of the season. It's, so, it's really frustrating, especially considering right now, I mean, I think at this point, this week's game is probably the most questionable that he's been. He's, I would almost say he's more teetering on the doubtful, doubtful yeah. but at the same time, their coaching staff isn't saying that. It, They're it, still it, saying he might play. At this point with him, if I own Calvin Johnson and I have any other type of, you know, somewhat reliable option, I'm, I'm rolling with them until Calvin proves he's healthy. Right. And if you've got a guy like a, um, like a Sammy Watkins, like yeah, a, I'm playing those guys over because they're healthy. Yeah. I mean, at this point, I mean, Calvin Johnson doesn't not look even remotely like Calvin Johnson, right. and they're showing no indication that they're like, oh yeah, we're going to get him right and he's going to be healthy and he's going to be Calvin again. So I don't know. Who, who and, knows and how long this the, lingers with him? Here's the thing: we we usually preach you have to play your studs. But at this point, it's been three weeks, like Dustin said, that this guy has not been at his at a hundred percent or anywhere near a hundred percent. And I know he's Calvin Johnson, and it's very possible that this week he comes out and catches six passes for 115 yards and two touchdowns. And yeah, I mean, and that would hurt to have it on your bench, but at least then you know he's healthy 
for the next game. It would hurt a lot more for him to have a one in your starting lineup. Right, exactly. I mean, I understand. You don't want to leave points on your bench. I get it. I'm completely with you on that. But you have to you have to balance the risk with the potential reward, and I'm not sure that the p- realistic potential reward is that kind of a game. So no, not right. Let's, now. I mean, he's got at least, he's got to at least prove he can even play a game. It's, it's pretty much right. just limping around, barely getting snaps. It's just he's got to prove he can be on the field before he's getting in my lineup. Right, agreed. Uh, then we got Jimmy Graham shoulder sprain. Uh, it it sounds like it's not going to be a big deal yeah. now. Thankfully, they're in a situation where they're on a bye this week, so he has that built-in opportunity to get healthy. Yeah, and I uh, he'll so, be good too. Right, I'm assuming he's going to be back in week seven, ready to, to ready to roll. By the way, week seven already, man. By the time he comes back, this this season is flying by. Yeah. I feel like I've I, it just started. But, uh, you know, we're heading into week six this weekend, so it's uh, it's really going by quick. Drew Stanton of the Arizona Cardinals. Now, this one, like I said, not really that big of a fantasy situation, but it is kind of a, a, an interesting scenario because Carson Palmer still isn't 100% healthy. If Drew Stanton does miss this weekend's game with a concussion, that means that they're going to have a rookie quarterback in there. And, man, he did not look good this week. Um you know, it's a, it's a really tough situation, especially if you own a Michael Floyd, a, uh, a Larry Fitzgerald. Um, these guys are not going to be guaranteed starters at this point unless they have at least Drew Stanton. I, I mean, I don't even know if Drew Stanton makes them guaranteed starters at this point. They, they do. I, ser- I still think that you, you can get by with Drew Stanton. Logan Thomas is a whole other thing, and he looked really good yeah. in the preseason, but it's the preseason. Mm-hmm. But it, it sounds like against Carson third Palmer string guys. is getting close. <laughs> Yeah, it, it sounds does. like Carson, yep. Carson Palmer is actually getting closer to playing. So yep, yep. once he comes in, right now might be a good buy low for all those guys in this offense right now because it seems like people are panicking with those guys. So very true. If a Michael Floyd is out there, you probably get him fairly cheap. Andre Ellington, his value is probably pretty low right now too. So any type of any of those type of guys, I'd probably be about trying to get right now. Agreed. And, uh, you know, like I said, I'm, I've am i been big on Michael Floyd. He, you know, dropped a complete dud against your Broncos this week. But the guy has physical talent, and uh, my opinion is still that he's going to lead that team in receptions, yards, touchdowns. So, um, you know, like Dustin said, I do like him as a buy low going forward. But let's talk about our waiver wire rankings for this week, guys that will replace some of the guys who you might have lost uh, running back specifically, and that's why you're going to see that the top of this list is definitely running back heavy. It's going to be most weeks, to be completely honest with you, and the reason for it is because the running back situations in the NFL are are so based on just guys touching the ball. So, you know, that's that's kind of the big thing. So, number one on my waiver wire rankings for this week, Andre Williams. We talked a little bit about him for the Giants. Uh, I'm a big fan of his. I do think that Rashad Jennings is going to miss a few weeks here. It sounds like he could be out through their week eight bye, which means that you're going to get a couple of games here from Andre Williams up against Philadelphia and Dallas, who are definitely Good nice matchups, matchups yep. for a guy like uh, like an Andre Williams. I do think that he is a a realistic possibility to score a touchdown in both of those games. He scored in back-to-back weeks here, so definitely like him going forward. Are you in agreement, Andre Williams, is your number one guy this week? Yeah, I have him number one, pretty much for the reasons you said. It's rare that you see a guy out there on the waiver wires at this point in the season where it's like, this guy's going to step right in and still be, he's going to immediately step in and going to be an RB1. He's not going to lose carries to the backup. Peyton Hills is not going to really be a timeshare with him. It's going to be Andre Williams' job unless he gives him a reason to bench him. Correct. And which could Correct. be one fumble and it's Peyton Hills' his job because Tom Coughlin's <laughs> like that. But for the time being, yeah, yeah Andre Williams. And, and number two on mine, I have, I know you're probably a bit lower, but I really think Justin Forsett has a role. Sure. And yeah. I, I think in PPR, Justin Forsett has been really good so far in PPR. Yeah. He's getting snaps on the field. I think he had 13 touches just this last week. And I really think, they, you know, he's in a low scoring game and he was still out there. And if they do get in a situation where Baltimore is losing by multiple scores, he's going to be the back on the field or on the field because of his pa- he catches well, better than either one of their backs by a significant margin, and he's pretty mm-hmm. good in pass pro. So I really think he is, he's yeah. almost a clip- got himself into a Danny Woodhead type of role in Baltimore, where he's going to have a role throughout the season there. Right, and and it doesn't really matter who their necessarily their main ball carrier no, is exactly. because he's still going to touch the ball he has a his decent role. amount of times. Yeah, I I agree with that uh, to some extent. My my whole thing about Justin Forsett is that I kind of think that what we saw from him this past week in terms of receptions, I think he had seven catches. I mean, 
that's his ceiling for sure, in my opinion, on catches. And don't get me wrong, that's a great ceiling to have. Seven catches, 55 yards alone would give you a 12 in uh, in your standard score in your PPR or scoring league. So I'm I'm not opposed to that by any means. What I what I worry a little bit about is that the that the Ravens are going to be in a situation where we see a three headed backfield. And I know, like we talked about, I do think Justin Forsett does have a role in the offense there by himself, uh, just as being like you said, the main third down back guy. So he's going to get some catches out of the backfield, but. It's very realistic that Justin Forsett comes out and catches three passes for 18 yards this week and rushes the ball uh, six times for 24 yards, in which case then you're in a really bad fantasy situation. That is not good production. Yeah, but he hasn't, I mean, th- what we've seen so far is that that hasn't been the case so far. I think we have a big enough sample size right now. we know who Justin right Forsett is. I okay. agree, but he has a role that he hasn't had before. I, I get it, but Justin Forsett, I'm sorry, I, I'm not buying the skill here. Um, I, I know no. that after four or five games here, we've seen decent production out of him, he's but we've also seen a couple of duds. yards per carry, and he's still so, extremely high in yards per catch, too. I that's that's why I think it's unsustainable. It might be, um, but I, I still think that just regardless, I think that he has he's getting a lot of snaps on the field. Fair enough. He's probably going to lead them in snaps going forward. And wouldn't you um, want to own that, though, on a team like the Ravens? It seems like they're going to be sh- pretty okay. I mean, own it, sure. Do I do I want to own it over a guy like Brandon Oliver over the next couple of weeks? I'm going to say no. And the reason for it is because I think Brandon Oliver has a bigger role in his offense and he's also in a better offense. Now, I'm not trying I'm not trying to tell people Brandon Oliver is going to be the next Darren Sproles. I know there's a lot of people out there that are trying to make those comparisons. Okay, just because they're both short guys who wear number 43 for the Chargers does not make him the next Darren Sproles, okay? <laughs> Uh, he caught four passes for 68 yards. That's unsustainable. He's probably going to catch two, three passes a game. Um, 19 carries for 114 yards, though. That's the part that I'm interested in, okay? And I'm, I'm not trying to say that this guy's going to come out here and get, you know, 10 yards per carry, you know, um, or, or, you know, whatever whatever he was at there. But I, I do think that he has a little bit more in him than a guy like Donald Brown, who is now out with a concussion, who might not play this weekend. So we have we have a situation where Brandon Oliver really is the only guy in that backfield right now. And clearly, even when Donald Brown's on the field, you know, Brandon Oliver is the guy that they like better. So I like that situation better. I think that he's more likely to touch the ball 15 times than Justin Forsett is. So you know, when when you're comparing the two, yeah, Justin Forsett might get more catches, but he's not more likely to touch the ball more often, if that makes sense, at least not over the next couple of games. And Brandon Oliver, as soon as Ryan Matthews comes back, Brandon Oliver is probably going to go back to being barely ownable. But if you're in a bye week situation, if you if you are somebody that owns uh, a Reggie Bush, let's say, and you and you have guys that are on a bye this week because there are a bunch of teams on buys. Uh, this, this is the kind of guy I would rather have Brandon Oliver this week and probably next week and maybe the week after yeah. than I would a guy like Justin Forsett. I just think that Forsett has a role for this this season and Oliver has a role for like two weeks maybe. Totally and fair. That's the totally thing. So fair. like I think if, if I'm in a situation where I'm thinking I might need a running back to have for, you know, more than a couple Long of weeks, term. Right. definitely pick up Justin Forsett over Oliver. Fair enough. I, I think that that's a very good assessment. Um, And it's just a different, it's a different need assessment. You know, I think I think that the the likelihood of Brandon Oliver having more points than Justin Forsett over the next three weeks is pretty good. But for the remainder of the year, I do like Justin Forsett better. So it's a matter of your situation that you're in. If you're in a situation, like I said, where you need uh, points for the next two weeks out of your running back position, you're going to have to start one of these guys. I'm going Oliver. But uh, if I'm looking for a guy to help me out for the for the majority of the year, it's got to be Justin Forsett over Brandon Oliver at this point. Uh, third on my list, I've got Ronnie Hillman, your Denver Broncos, and I know you're a big Ronnie Hillman supporter, so tell okay. me why <laughs> – I'm just joking. No, tell me, though, why uh, this this Denver Broncos running back situation, why all the experts are really pointing at Ronnie Hillman as being the only realistic guy to touch the ball there. Yeah, see, I don't I don't agree with that because I've seen Ronnie Hillman. And, but also, he's my number three player this week because, again, Monty Ball logic. I, I cannot stand Monty Ball. I cannot stand It's the enough. situation. I hate him so much. And I yeah. hated him last year. I hated him this year. I hated him when they drafted him. And he was still and like a top so, And so does guy. Peyton Manning, right? Yeah. He hates no, him too. Everyone hates him. <laughs> he's just he's a piece of shit. But it's it, it's the role and it really seems like for whatever reason the Denver coaches were really praising Ronnie Hillman in the offseason. They were saying, you know, they really liked him and blah blah blah. 
And the thing is, is C.J. Anderson's pass protection, who most people perceive to be the handcuff, still isn't really up to snuff. It's okay, but Ronnie Holmes is bad. The yeah. one running back who is, is okay in pass protection is Juwan Thompson. So I really yeah. think that if he's if there is going to be a back that's going to see, you know, a third down duties with Hillman is in you know in pass protection scenario, it's going to be Juwan Thompson. And Juwan Thompson, I think, is probably the best of the three, honestly, just seen with my own eyes. But but for, for this, but week, you like Ronnie Hillman. <laughs> yeah, if we're picking one up, I'm definitely picking Ronnie Hillman up. But I still, yeah. I think you could probably, if you're in a super deep league, I'm definitely rostering Juwan Thompson too. But this week they play the Jets. I don't know, no matter who it is, I don't think that's a good matchup for any running back, really. Right. So it, it, if we're gonna bank on getting a goal line TD and you know having a, a decent fantasy day, I could see it. It'll probably go to Hillman just because I think he'll see the most snaps and he has the highest likelihood for it. So, but beyond that, I think after this week, I think it's San Francisco, which is another tough matchup, but then I'm pretty sure it's San Diego. So, if Moneyball's expected to miss about a month, those will be his three matchups for Ronnie Hillman. Three good, or I, I should say three, one very good, or multiple very good defenses, two very good teams, one ass team. But it's going to be a hard matchup for him no matter what. Right. In any of these right. three weeks. So, because of that, I'm, I'm four sets ahead of Andre Williams ahead of him. I still think he's worth rostering because I think if he looks good, I think there's a very good shot just because how bad Monty Ball is. He could keep the starting gig. I don't see yeah. why he couldn't because Monty Ball looks so bad. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. And that's something that I think we have to make sure that we analyze with these situations because a guy like Brandon Oliver, like I mentioned, I don't think has a realistic possibility of supplanting uh, a Ryan Matthews out of his job. So, you know, a Ronnie Hillman, though, however, could potentially step in and steal the job from Ronnie Ball just because of how bad he's looked. But I also want to keep in mind, too, Ronnie Hillman, I mean, this was the biggest game. Is it the biggest game he's ever had in his career this past week? For Hillman? Yeah. No, I'm pretty sure there was a game where he had, was it last year, I want to say, where he had, I want to say like 80 yards in a TD or something. Okay. Like, I'm fairly sure he had that at one point or another last year because they were blowing teams out and they were going to mop up duty. Sure. But this this past week, though, 64 yards on 15 carries. So, I mean, that's like a four yard per carry average, roughly. Nothing special out of Ronnie Hillman. And and keep in mind, too, we love this situation. We don't love the backs. If I mean, we've talked about this before. We've, we've used guys like CJ Spiller as an example. We talked about prior to doing this podcast, we were just BSing. And we talked about Andre Ellington. Can you imagine how good these guys would be in the Denver offense? But we have what we have, and we've yeah. got Ronnie Hillman, and, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, it's just – it's one of those things where it just – it seems like – I never understood even the offseason how they were really comfortable going into the season with Monty Ball. And it was just like – no Sean was out there. He barely signed for anything. He was so good for our offense last last year because of his ability right. to play three-down role. And there's so few true three-down running backs out there because he's so good in pass protection. Right. People people undervalue that so much with Noshan. He was he's an elite pass blocker for a running back. Right. And, and it's a big reason too why people don't see or the, a lot of people don't realize why rookie running backs tend to not see the field early in their as career. Think. Yeah. It's, right. it's one of those things that it's just I, I, I John Elway made so many good decisions in the offseason, but it just seems like it, it just seems so ridiculous that he you know, he goes out there and he's all in and he goes a keep to leave Demarcus Ware, T J Ward Drafts Bradley Roby, gets these guys in there, and then he screws himself up and he gets Monty Ball. And he's like, right. here's our answer to a running game is this piece of trash. <laughs> I, I just I don't understand how you can allow yourself to do that. I'm still hoping up I'm still holding out some hope that CJ Spiller will be out there and maybe they'll trade for him, but yeah. it seems pretty unlikely. Yeah, it so. seems pretty unlikely. But if that does happen, man, CJ Spiller, right oh my gosh. Uh, I'm I'm trading pretty much the world for CJ Spiller if he ends up in Denver, and I'm not a big CJ Spiller fan. Let's just put it that way. So uh, next guy on our list, or at least on my list, is a guy who I can't believe isn't owned in more leagues. And I almost want to put him above some of these running backs because I think that he has serious value going forward. The only reason that he's not is because running back is just so much more barren right now. It's just a wasteland of crap. Uh, and that's why I've, I don't I don't have him a little bit higher. But Brian Quick, St. Louis Rams, currently ranked as the number 14 ranked wide receiver in standard scoring leagues this season. St. Louis has already had their bye. This guy has realistic possibility when they finish this week's game of being a top 10 wide receiver. Seriously. Yeah. He needs to be owned in almost every league at this point. Uh, he hasn't had under 60 yards in any game this year. Three touchdowns in his past two games. 
I don't see what there is to dislike about this guy. I mean, Austin Davis clearly likes him. He's clearly the number one there. I mean, obviously, it's not a great offense to begin with, but the opportunity is there, right? Yeah, I mean, Larry Fitzgerald lived off mop-up duty for a wide receiver multiple years. True. So, I mean, yeah. it's not like it can't be really sustainable. It's it's one of those guys where, like, they drafted him clearly. They used, a very, they used the first pick of the second round to get him. You know, they were very high. Right. They took him over a guy like Alshon Jeffrey, which is obviously a terrible decision. But Right, yeah, in hindsight. I yeah. mean, they liked him. So, it, there's Jeff Fisher clearly liked him, too. I mean, clearly the current staff liked him. So Correct. I don't see his role going away anytime soon. And sometimes having a guy on a team that's down every single week isn't, it isn't a bad thing. It means yep. they're going to have to throw, and he's going to have snaps, and he's clearly established himself as the number one. He's only beating out just, like, ass clown Tavon Austin or, you know, <laughs> a guy like uh, Kenny Britt. You know, he's he's going to see the majority of, this, of the, the target, especially in the red zone, for how big he is. He's really done a, a much better job this year as far as asserting himself physically, you can just tell. He's going out there, and he's actually willing to scrap with a lot of the corners, and he wasn't willing to do that in his earlier years. So, yeah, he's, he's very high for me, too. I've been high on him. I've, he's been rostered in every league. I'm in, and because I, if he was out there in just last week or the week before that, I was picking him up. He's my number right. five this week behind only uh, Oliver, like you said. Yep, yep. So uh, definitely like him a lot. Now, uh, the next guy on my list is another wide receiver. Well, actually, I have Justin Forsett next, but, you know, we talked a little hater. bit about him. But uh, not a hater. It's just <laughs> situational, man. I, I, just, I, I don't like him for big points over the next few weeks here. Uh, James Jones, though. Another guy who just, I don't understand how he's not owned in more leagues. Yeah. Uh, clearly the number one wide receiver out there in Oakland. Oakland Again, bias not a good him. offense. What was that? I said the Oakland bias is hurting him. Everyone thinks anything yeah. has to do with Oakland and you want nothing to do. But there yeah. are some exceptions and exceptions, and he is certainly one of them. Right. He's definitely the guy out there. Um, you know, it, it, it's not like he's going to be out there catching no a touchdown. Uh, yeah. And the other thing, too, is it's not like he's going to be out there catching a touchdown every single game. But, I mean, this guy is only a couple years removed from leading the NFL in touchdowns. Yeah. And I know that was in a much better offense, but still, the guy has skills. Yeah. The guy has realistic 10 touchdown potential in the NFL. And it's so hard to get that on the waiver wire. And for him to be an unowned in more than half of leagues right now is ridiculous. Yeah, that's silly. It's it's just ridiculous. I mean, especially when there are just bums out there getting still held. And, and I don't understand why a guy like, you know, a, I, I don't know why people would have like a guy like a John Brown on their roster over a James Jones. Now, I understand John Brown has had some decent games in here, but he's not. He's the number three oh, I mean, option at best in you, that offense. You could make the case he has higher upside, though, than a Justin, than James Jones. I'm not saying I necessarily if, could agree with if it, but James I'm saying Jones you can at least see has that, his, if, if James Jones has his best season against John Brown's best season, I'm taking James Jones, man. It's different, though, because James Jones is in Oakland. Now. It's not James Jones, Green Bay, that we're comparing this to. And I, so I think True. his upside is capped by the fact that they're the Raiders. And I think the Cardinals are obviously an infinitely better team than the Oakland Raiders. And Carson Palmer will be back for John Brown, who has a huge arm, who's going to, you know, presumably help him for the deep ball, which is what Fair he's going to make his money on. I'm not saying I agree with it, but you could make the point that the upside is higher with John Brown. I agree with you, though, especially Rod Streeter went on the IR recently today, too, who was essentially another guy there. One of the very mm -hmm. few receivers taking away targets from James Jones. He's gone now, too. He has to be owned in almost every, every league. And I'll tell you another guy who I would straight up drop right now for James Jones that mm. I've been hating on since week one. I've hated on some since Patterson. before the preseason. Yeah, Cordero Patterson, yeah. man. The guy is just, I'm sorry, two catches for eight yards this week. No, he's dead. I mean, the yeah. thing is, I mean, like, some people he's, are saying he's it's owned hurt. in 100% of weeks. It's because, 100%. again, upside. I mean, yeah. he has that. Upside on what, ability. though? I know. Upside but, on what? You have to touch the ball to have upside. I know, but it's not like we've never seen a guy come out where he's not really seen a lot of targets, and then he really starts to hit his stride. I mean, Larry Fitzgerald was sort of that last year, and he really started getting going towards later in the year. Yeah, but Larry Fitzgerald is Larry Fitzgerald. I agree. I mean, I'm Cordero not Patterson. To compare him on a talent level, but I, I also think that if you're one of those people who probably was high enough to take Cordero Patterson, where he was going, getting overdrafted in a lot of leagues, it's probably gonna be hard to admit like I need to just flat out drop this guy at this stage yeah. of the season, you know. Yeah, there. I've, I've, I actually saw him go in the third round of the draft yeah. that I was in. I, mean, and I, I didn't like, see him go out of the sixth and most. Ugh, man, I mean, I'm from Minnesota, so we have a little bit of that Minnesota boost yeah, on our players. Obviously. People, people assume that everybody's better than they are, but um, yeah, it's it's gross at this point with a guy like Cordero Patterson. Uh, moving on, though, we've got a couple other guys that I wanted to touch on. Marvin Jones coming back from an injury. 
that's a potential situation where we could see some nice fantasy production out of that wide receiver two position there. Mohamed Sanu is, has done pretty well for himself in that role, but I do think he gets dropped down to Mar, uh, to uh, number three with Marvin Jones coming back. you agree? Yeah, no, certainly. I, and they really like Marvin Jones in Cincinnati too, and Andy Dalton has good chemistry with him. Right. I, I definitely think that he's going to be one of those guys that uh, um, comes in immediately, has a little bit of a role for him, and he's owned in just like nothing. He's owned in like 3% of the league. So Correct. if you're in, in need of a wide receiver, just a stash, and he has good upside. I mean, Mohamed Sanu, I'm not, excuse me, Marvin Jones had some monster games last week, last year. Yes, he did. So he's not, he's not below catching, you know, a two, three TD game at a random week. It could happen with him. So yep, absolutely. he's definitely one of those guys that needs to probably be owned in the majority of leagues too. It would have been nice to see him on the field for that offense uh, when they played New England this past week. Yeah, give him another threat outside because A.J. Yeah. Green had a bad game. Yeah. Yep. A.J. Green uh, held down by the best defensive player in football, oh, according to Mike and Mike. Mike Greenberg. Um, yeah, Darrell Reeves is the best defensive player in the NFL, according to Mike Greenberg. Most yeah. asinine, dumb shit Patriots fought. J.J. Watt's just over there like, okay, okay, yeah. dudes. <laughs> so. You can make the case that Darrell Reeves isn't even the best defensive player on his own fucking team. Yeah, I, I mean, I I still think Darrell Revis is an excellent player, but I mean, yeah, it's just at this it's point just he's absurd. not a top three corner. And no Whatever, me otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever at this point. You but get dick point like being, Bo a week ago, and now you're telling me you're the best defense player. In the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> point being it would have been nice to see marvin jones on the field to give them another option at the wide receiver position but uh another guy who you should be considering for wide receiver depth on your team is a guy who made his nfl debut this past week odell beckham jr of the new york giants caught four passes for 44 yards and a touchdown that touchdown was pretty nice too he used his body in the end zone uh shielded the ball from the defender made a nice catch um, maybe he was a little bit too excited about the touchdown but i guess you can't blame him his first nfl touchdown yeah. What do you think about this guy going forward? I mean, do you think he has a potential to be a guy that you could consider ever starting this year? Or, I mean, is it just too many mouths to feed in this offense? Yeah, I could definitely see it happening. I mean, it, it, I also think that, um, I mean, with the way the, the Giants offense has been redone, it, it's so much quick timing. I think there's certainly in PPR he has much better upside, but I still like him in standard as well. But it, they, they liked him a lot. You know, he looked good up until he got hurt. He was really good at LSU, so... I don't see any reason why he can't have a, sustain, a sustainable role in that offense. I, I think that, uh, you know, he, he clearly showed that he's not, he's, he's already like pretty much adjusted himself pretty well to the NFL game. I, I'd at least wait and see another, you know, couple games before you really start relying on him week to week for, you know, a start, but he should definitely own to monitor because that offense looks like it's going to be able to produce pretty good re, uh, uh, stats for receivers just based on how quick it is with the passing. Right. Absolutely. Uh, and then uh, just another guy, too, that I, I forgot to mention earlier on my list. I actually have him uh, listed at number five on my list. I, I don't know if I, I don't think I mentioned him. Ruben Randall uh, owned only in 50 percent of leagues right now. Yeah, I wouldn't even think he'd be available in most. But yeah, I mean, he's another guy should be owned in most leagues. That's that's just criminal. I mean, obviously, I, I like Ruben Randall better than Beckham going forward. Yeah, but, me too. Ruben Randall should really be owned in every league at this point, in my yeah, opinion. He shouldn't be on a waiver. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, currently he leads their team with 40 targets on the year. He has two more than Victor Cruz. Yeah. I mean, you'd I still mean, rather have Victor Cruz, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But I mean, I think it's worth noting, though, that oh, Ruben absolutely. Randall led the, the, led the league or led the team in catches with 10 this past week. And on the year, he has more than Victor Cruz. So, I mean, it's. It's not like it's just a one-week thing. This guy's catching a lot of passes in that offense, and like we just mentioned, this offense is going to put up points on the board. They're going to be a bad defense. They're going to be in a lot of shootouts this year, and Eli Manning's going to throw a lot of interceptions, but just like like Dustin mentioned uh, with a guy like Brian Quick, your offense doesn't necessarily have to be good in the first three quarters. If you come out there and pass every single play in the fourth quarter, yep. your receivers suddenly are there. valuable. Yeah, opportunity so, will be there. Yep, so we we like those type of a situations. Um, like I said, definitely own him in just about every single league. I don't see much of a reason for him not to be owned. Uh, a couple other guys that I wanted to just touch on real quickly that are basically owned in no leagues, and these guys are all pretty much stash guys at this point. Uh, we've got a guy named ben Benny Cunningham, who Dustin was pretty high on coming into the year as potentially taking the job from Zach Stacy at some point throughout the season, and this might be his opportunity with Zach Stacy. Uh, just banged he, He's yeah. a little bit banged up. I, I mean, like I said, it does sound like he's going to play this weekend, but we don't know that for sure. And even if he is going to play, is he going to be at 100%? If not, then Benny Cunningham might lead the league in, or lead the team in carries. So, you know, 
it's a situation where he could do okay. We don't really know yet. He's definitely the better receiving back of the two, though. Yeah, without so, question. Yeah, so he's only owned in 1% of leagues. Like I said, a stash guy for sure. A couple other guys that should be potential stash guys if you're in deeper leagues. Carson Palmer coming back from an injury like we had talked about. Now, the major concern with him is that nerve injury in his right throwing shoulder, man. Uh, I mean, are you worried about that going forward? No, because I think once it's healed, it'll be healed. He's either, yeah. either going to have the arm strength there. I mean, Denard Robinson had a similar injury actually at Michigan okay. when he was still there. And it's one of those things where if he gets the strength back, the strength back. There's not really a whole lot of risk there. So if he's good, he's good. There's not a whole lot of risk going forward. And the other thing that I like, too, is that unlike Calvin Johnson, he's made, he's waiting until you get healthy. And yep. he's not pushing himself to go out there and get hurt make it worse. So definitely like seeing that. Uh, a couple other guys to own. Uh, Austin Davis, another quarterback. He's thrown for over 700 yards and six touchdowns in his past two games. Now, against Philadelphia and Dallas, not great defenses. And he's got brutal matchups coming up against San Francisco and Seattle over the next two weeks. But the end of his season isn't that bad. Seattle, or he has, uh, after the Seattle game and the San Francisco game, he has still good matchups at left against uh, San Diego, Oakland, Washington, the Giants. So definitely a couple games in there where you could consider starting him as a bye week option or if you're in a two-quarterback league. Could do worse than Austin Davis. Uh, Tim Wright at tight end for the New England Patriots. I know, Dustin, you're you're already yeah, cringing at this yeah, one. No, I'm not but I don't give a fuck about Tim Wright. <laughs> but look, man, tight end is just a disaster area this year for most people. If you're in a bye week and you've got a tight end like you know a guy who's not a super spectacular player, um, trying to think of a good example, a, uh, you know, or right now if you've got a Vernon Davis. You know, a guy who you just, uh, you you expected him to be your every week starter. you got to have somebody. I think you could do worse than Tim Wright. Now, I don't really think that he's going to sustain the, the uh, five passes for 85 yards and a touchdown that he had this past week, but he could sneak in there for a touchdown every once in a while. I don't mind him as a, as a potential stash guy, especially considering the injury history of Rob Gronkowski in front of him. I mean, yeah. do you have any interest yeah. at all in, I, I in having him on your Tim team? Right. Nah, no. Tim right. All right, well, I, I I mostly agree with Dustin, but like I mentioned, this is just kind of a stash situation. Uh, another guy, too, that I wanted to just mention real quickly, Storm Johnson of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, this is yeah, an awful situation. Well, I mean, he <laughs> might be. I mean, it, the thing is, is it's still Toby Gerhardt logic. If you didn't like Toby Gerhardt before, I just don't think that offense is going to score enough to really be sustainable for any running back. Yeah. And, I mean, Toby Gerhardt looks like he's just dead dog shit forever now, but... Yeah, I, I still may, maybe Storm Johnson. He was Blake Bortles' teammate at UCF. You know, he liked him, so I, I don't see any reason why he couldn't get significant carries. It's just gonna be how meaningful are those carries? Correct. Right. Um, then uh, George Wynn as a as a guy who is uh, the Detroit Lions backup running back. We don't really know the situation with Reggie Bush and and with the running backs in front of him, Joy Bell included. So he could potentially sneak in there as a starter this week. Don't love him even if he is healthy, but, you know, he could do worse. And then uh, you wanted to talk a little bit about Owen Daniels, right? Yeah, I mean, just, yeah, I, I think that he should probably be owned in a lot of leagues right now. The way, again, new offensive scene with uh, Flacco and Kubiak is instilled in uh, Baltimore. And Pitt is out for the year. You know, if you're hurting for tight end play because, you know, you own any of the guys that really have underperformed so far, Vernon Davis has still been hurt. I definitely think Owen Daniels is worth a shot to pick up. He was my number nine player this week. Fair enough. All right, so let's talk to, about our questions that we got from YouTube and Twitter. Uh, remember, guys, if you have any questions for us about this weekend's games or any trade questions or anything that you want to uh, ask us specifically about fantasy football, make sure you leave those in the comments section below or tweet them to us at ClickwoodTV or at Project KSL. Also, be sure to send Project KSL that follow. Mm -hmm. Don't forget to do that, guys. Uh from Colton's GT on YouTube, he has a question. This one's specifically for you, Dustin, and we talked a little bit about it before. He says, I've got a question about uh, for the other Broncos fan. Mr. Project, what's your thoughts on Denver's backfield? I believe from day one, Monty Ball was a flex at best. Hillman dips his hand in butter before every play. Uh, CJ, eh. But Juwan Thompson? What are your thoughts? We already talked a little bit about this, but what do you yeah, think? Yeah, again, we sort of talked about it. It's I, I, none of them appear to be that talented. I honestly think Juwan Thompson might be the most talented of the four, as sad as that is. Yeah, it's all situation. Denver's offense is going to score a shitload of points like they always do. It's the number one fantasy offense to have players with. I, I think that going forward, like you said, Monty Ball is going to miss time. If Ronnie Hellman goes out there and he's at least competent, I don't see how he loses the job to Monty Ball when he comes back. 
because Monty Ball basically hasn't played for five weeks. Yeah. So and yeah. I think that, like I said, I, I think I'd rather have Juwan Thompson than C.J. Anderson because of his pass protection ability. Hillman's the one to go own going forward, at least for the time being, and then I think I'd have Thompson ahead of C.J. Anderson. But we're still keeping Monty Ball rostered, right? We're not dropping yeah, him. Yeah, no, I think you have to, at least, because you got to see yeah. what Hillman does. I mean, if Hillman goes right. out there and is shitty, I don't see why Monty Ball wouldn't get the roll back. So. Right. It, it, you All just right. got to hold him to monitor it and see what happens. Yeah, I, I pretty much agree with that as well. So next question is from Ryan Mills on YouTube, and this one involves LaShawn McCoy. He says, will LaShawn McCoy get back in stride in the near future, or should I trade him? And this one I think is kind of interesting because this guy is probably the biggest dud so far of the first round that I can think of as far as, like, being healthy and just playing like crap. Yeah, he's, not, he's a different thing than Adrian Peterson, obviously. Yeah, right, it's, right. It's Yeah, I'd trade him because I saw someone talking about that was actually breaking down all his snaps and how he's looked on his runs. And a lot of people are saying the explosion just isn't there this year. Mm-hmm. And they're saying the offensive line is clearly, you know, not doing very good this year either because of all the injuries and everything else. But they're saying when he cuts outside, he really is just not nearly as explosive as he was last year. So that could be maybe he has an Aggie injury we don't know about. Maybe right. he just didn't have a very good diet in the offseason. It could be a million things. But if he's not as explosive, then you, it's, that's, his, that's the reason you draft LaShawn McCoy. So right. if that's not there, then, yeah, it's something super concerning. So the next question that we have is actually kind of going to build off of that, and it's it's a trade question involving LaShawn McCoy. It's from RKMH65 on YouTube, and he wants to know, should I trade AJ Green plus Sammy Watkins for Shady McCoy? Now, I'm assuming that he's actually the one giving up AJ Green and, Sa- AJ Green and Sammy Watkins, and he'd be getting McCoy. Nah. I'm Your not. thoughts? No, I'm not. I, AJ Green is still AJ Green. He's going to finish as the top five wide receiver. Yep. And there's no indication whatsoever right now that Sean McCoy finishes the top five running back. So and unless we, liked, you're, we like Sammy Watkins. Yeah, I think Sammy Watkins is a good player to own to going forward, too. He had a good game versus Buffalo with Kyle Orton in there versus a very good Buffalo or uh, Detroit defense. So Correct, yep. I, I definitely think that he could be – he's definitely worth rostering, you know, definitely worth rostering, probably worth starting in a lot of leagues going forward, too. I definitely wouldn't give that up to get a guy like Sean McCoy at this point. So let me ask you then, if you're if you're a, a person that owns LaShawn McCoy, do you have any targets out there for something that you're looking for? I mean, I, 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 I hate to always Ellington, ask I'm you that. But, okay, there you go. Yeah, that's that's a good one. Andre I Ellington. Mean, I, I talked to actually a buddy of mine earlier, and he actually owns LaShawn McCoy in a league, and he was asking mm-hmm. me, you know, what would you do with so-and-so and so-and-so. I'm like, I don't know, man. I'm like, if I have LaShawn McCoy, if someone offers me Andre Ellington, I'm doing it. And he kind mm-hmm. of disagreed with me on it a little bit, but I kept telling him, like, Andre Ellington's bad game in PPR this year is a 10. And obviously a 10 is not a great game. And, you know, depending on where you take Andre Ellington, he could do better. But a 10 is a lot better than a 2. Right. And LaShawn McCoy Absolutely. has had just multiple complete trainer at games. You're not losing with Andre Ellington dropping a 10 on you. And Andre Ellington has that absolute monster game potential because he's just so shifty and quick in the open field. He could take a TD to the house anytime. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I pretty much agree with that at this point. Yeah, I mean, uh, Andre Ellington's, I think, a, a great example of somebody that you could be targeting. Uh, there are still people out there as well who, just based off of the LaShawn McCoy name, would potentially give you a guy like Giovanni Bernard. Possibly. And if you could, yeah. if you could do, so, if you could flip something like that, man, you are doing great. Yeah, and I we mean, both, it, we both love that situation. We think that the we think the world of the Cincinnati running game, both of the guys in that in that running yeah, game. Yeah, I, I think that what I'd do is if I saw whoever has Andre Ellington in my league, I'd probably I'd offer LaShawn McCoy in for Andre Ellington and check a receiver or a tight end that they have. And just sure. see where they're at, because you they might be like, Oh my god, I'm gonna offer LaShawn McCoy for Andre Ellington, you know? Right. I only gotta throw in, you know, whoever it might be, Mike Wallace to get this deal done. I'm doing it but yeah, for I think the person who's getting Andre Ellington, it's a sweet deal for them. And LaShawn right. McCoy might live off his name and get you a deal done. Yep, because there are some people out there that will still believe that these guys are who they were last year. And LaShawn yeah. McCoy certainly has not been that. So yeah. hope that answered your questions, guys. Uh, again, make sure you tweet those questions to us at Project KSL or at Clickwood TV or leave them in the comment section below of this video. Don't leave it in a different video, damn it. I've seen you guys doing that. I'm not answering those freaking <laughs> questions, you jackasses. Anyways, uh, let's move on to our buy low and sell highs for the week. This is the final segment of our show. We do it every week, but I want to get it right into it. Uh, Dustin, who is your buy low of the week? My buy low this week, um, I looked at a couple different names, but I ended up deciding on Fred Jackson, mm-hmm. who, who got hurt a little bit this last game. 
But Fred Jackson is still, no matter what happens to Chase Spiller, he's the guy there in that offense. They, they give him the ball more. They clearly trust him more. They like him for their offense better. And he's been pretty good minus one game this year. He hasn't really had a whole lot of dud games this year, especially in PPR. And right now the owner has him. He's probably questionable going this week. Even if he misses this week, I think he'll be better going forward. So his value will probably be pretty low right now. And if you're in a running back situation where you're really needing someone, I would definitely feel comfortable getting a guy like Fred Jackson and starting him. Yeah, I I completely agree with that. And the nice thing about somebody that owns Fred Jackson right now is that they probably had Fred Jackson as like their RB3, RB4 going into the year. So they probably aren't starting him. So, I mean, it's the kind of situation, just like Dustin had mentioned before, where there's some guys that are just expendable for certain teams. So you might be able to get him for less than you would other players. So I do like that situation a lot. I think Fred Jackson's a good one for a buy low right now. The, The guy who I have as my buy low this week is Eric Decker. And I always say it's the best time to trade for a guy when he's coming off of a bad game. And I know Decker didn't really play in week five, but uh, unlike Kelvin Johnson, because he really just decided he wanted to get healthier, the team decided they wanted to get him healthy, but he still leads the team with 204 yards and two touchdowns on the year. Uh, He has a great matchup coming up here, an interesting one against the Broncos, uh, against his former team. Probably not going to have 100 uh, receptions. He's probably not going to have, uh, you know, a thousand yards on the year, but he's still a big time red zone threat. And I think he's a good low end wide receiver too, with some upside. And he's definitely good enough to be an every week flex so long as he's healthy and on the field. So I definitely like him going forward. Uh, my sell high for this week, Drew Brees. And I know that means you really a sell high. <laughs> well, the reason that I say he's a sell high I, is for I, the I same reason we talked about with LaShawn McCoy. Yeah, name. Yeah, it's the name recognition. I mean, this guy is still going to be an elite fantasy quarterback. When I say elite, I mean probably top five, five, um, but not the level of Peyton Manning. Okay. Uh, Peyton Manning is his own tier. And then there's the guys like Aaron Rodgers. And I I also, I I mean, we talked about this. Andrew Luck is my number two quarterback going forward. Me too. Yep, we, we talked about that last week. I mean, the guy just continues to produce. But guys like Aaron Rodgers, like Drew Brees, like Matt Stafford, those guys are kind of at that second tier. Maybe even you might want to consider them almost a third tier at this point at quarterback. But they're living off of that name value. And you can still get good stuff in return for them. Drew Brees currently the number nine fantasy quarterback. Jimmy Graham's banged up. And I know we talked about that we think he's going to be back and fine going forward. But if that injury is something that bothers him at all, that's going to hurt Drew Brees' touchdown potential. Oh, it's going to hurt him, yeah, significantly. But I, I don't think it will, though. But, I mean, yeah, if, yeah. if Graham were to go down, it's a nightmare because Colston's been terrible this year. So Right, and they don't have another option at tight end that's a realistic Oh, threat. no, they have no one. So, yeah. uh, I mean, the other thing, too, Drew Brees hasn't thrown for more than two touchdowns in any game this year. And the uh, thing that's more concerning about that is if you look at who he's played, it's just like yeah. the, whole, the whole appeal to Drew Brees for people drafting him This was like, oh, man, look at his schedule. Yeah, and he's played that schedule, and he's still underperformed like hell. So it, yeah, it, it's. I completely agree. If you can get someone to give you something significant for Drew Brees, I mean, if someone could offer you Andrew Luck straight up for Drew Brees, which I don't think people would do yeah. at this point, but yeah, you throw it out there, and you might see someone who drafted Andrew Luck in the you know sixth round or wherever he was going in, Drew Brees in the second, you know, yeah, might work yeah. for you. Well, you know, and then uh, the other thing too that I wanted to mention. Um, He has his bye week this week, so you might want to consider waiting a week to trade him. But I do think though, buys a lot lower. Right, exactly. If they're going into their buy, because the problem is that they're probably going to have to give you their quarterback in a lot of cases or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, but the thing is though, is I want to I want to also mention too uh, a specific guy that I'm actually targeting right now is a guy who I've never been high on, but after seeing what he did on Monday Night Football, Russell Wilson. Uh, yeah, I'm not. Wilson. I'm not talking about him straight up for Drew Brees. Okay, I, I don't don't get that wrong. But what I'd I'm saying it. is, if you can package Russell, if you can get Russell Wilson and a solid wide receiver, a solid running, running back, back or something, yeah. get do that trade. Get Drew Brees off your roster right now. Be well, he still has that Drew Brees elite quarterback name value. Russell Wilson's going to give you some rushing yardage. He's probably not going to score quite as many points as Drew Brees, but look, he's going to be real close, and he might. He's going to be a lot him, closer so yeah. than people think he's going to be. So you get that you get that about the same quarterback. I mean, like I said, he's probably going to outscore him, but you know, real close on the quarterback. And then if you can get that upgrade at another position, that's where you want to do it. Dustin, who is your sell high this week? Um, this week I have a guy who's also coming off of another pretty good game, and I have uh, from your Cowboys, I have Terrence Williams. 
And You're getting rid of T Willie? Yeah, Come on now. Well, it's it's just that his TD pace is so unsustainable right now. Oh, come if, on. If you're looking at the touchdowns he's getting, he's not going to finish those TDs. <laughs> come so, on, man. What it, are you talking about? This week he has Seattle. It's a bad game. I mean, he's already has, what, five TDs on the air? Five TDs in five games. He's a yeah. beast. Yeah, that's clearly not going to sustain. I think he's like, I think he's a top 15 wide receiver right now in PPR. So Top you can, 10 in non-PPR. He's the ninth he? wide God. receiver in standard scoring. Yeah, yeah so, number nine. I mean, that's, yeah. I, I have two behind think, Dez. Right now, you could maybe just get something super significant for him. I mean, if a guy's out there and he's offering you in standard, if you're getting offered, maybe Brandon Marshall, because Brandon Marshall's been so bad the past few weeks because he's been out dealing with that injury, but Trestman seems he's good to go. I'd throw it out there and at least just see where the interest is with Brandon Marshall. owner he's probably frustrated with Marshall. I would even do it for a, a step down from that. I mean... Oh, yeah, I'm just saying I, I would target Marshall initially, though. I think he'd be the prime offer to whoever has Marshall. I'm looking at guys like Emmanuel Sanders. Oh, I'm yeah, looking absolutely. at guys like, um, uh, you know, even a potentially guy like, like a guy like a Kelvin Benjamin, potentially. Um, I don't know if I, I'd I do mean, it for Benjamin. I, I, I'd, it'd be close. I don't know if I would quite do that. I'd definitely do it for Emmanuel Sanders, though. And then, uh, you know, and then obviously you're looking at, you know, if you're in a running back need, like a lot of people are right now, Terrence Williams is really the ideal guy, I think, because he's probably not a guy you relied on going into the year as one of your starters at wide receiver. So he's probably sitting on your bench right now or maybe just, you know, teetering on that flex position. So the nice thing about him is that he's probably expendable on a lot of people's teams. Get him off your team, get a running back in return to fill that hole for you. Uh, and I really think that you'll be very happy with that. I do love Terrence Williams as a player, but like Dustin mentioned, that pace that he's on right now, you know, he right now he's on a 16 touchdown pace. Yeah, it's not going to happen. happen. I mean, if he gets to double digits, that would be amazing. I, I don't even necessarily think that I see that happening. Yeah. I mean, if he catches four touchdowns over the final 11 games of the year, I wouldn't be surprised at all. So, you know, not not a bad buy uh, or sell high at this point in the season for Terrence Williams. Definitely agreed on that one. So that is going to do it for today's episode. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you learned something. If you did, make sure you press that like button and plus also press the subscribe button so that you can be updated when we, when we put out our new episodes. If you have any questions about your lineup for next week's games, if, you, if you're thinking about making any trades, if you have any general fantasy football questions, make sure you leave those in the comment section or tweet them to us at ClickwithTV or at Project KSL. We'll do our best to answer them on our next episode, which should be out probably, uh, we're thinking probably Saturday. So thank you guys again. Check back with us later this week for week six NFL preview here on the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.